Hi guys, good evening. Welcome once again, and uh, we are here to do a quick fire round of revisions with our uh, all uh, important uh, obstetrics and gynae subject. And I know you are very tense, so we'll not uh, do much of uh, talking right now about the uh, whole of theory. We'll just tell you gross facts, gross facts which we will not have any arguments. We'll just finish them off so that you have a quick revision, and we go back to our other subjects. All right, so quick revision and uh, up to the mark kind of to the mark kind of discussion. All right. Uh, let's start our discussion uh, immediately and we'll start the one-liners. These one-liners are important for all the exams. Uh, of course, the NEET exam is coming up first and then we also have the exam for the FMGs coming in next. So it is uh, equally important for all you students and uh, those final year students also watching this. I'm sure that you're going to take these leads for reading your subject whenever you're writing your exams. All right, so welcome once again and let's start right away. So, Asherman syndrome is due to overzealous curettage and overzealous curettage means scraping even beyond the stage of bubble forming in the blood bubbles forming and grating sound. So beyond the stage, beyond bubbling of blood and grating sound. So you're getting a grating sound because you're, you've taken out the endometrium, you've taken out the basal lamella, and now you're scraping on the muscle. So if you get that grating sound, that means you've done too much of a vigorous curettage. So stop at that moment. If you go on doing that, then you're going to cause Eschermann syndrome. So Eschermann syndrome, the question which came to you, which is more likely to cause Eschermann syndrome. So PPH is secondary PPH. So when you do secondary PPH curettage, that curettage is more likely to cause Eschermann syndrome than the curettage done for an MTP or for a AUB. So those who want me to write it properly, secondary PPH. For the secondary PPH, if you do the curettage, that is more likely to cause Eschermann syndrome than the curettage for MTP and abnormal uterine bleeding. Now, cryptomenorrhea is seen in imperforate hymen. All of you know imperforate hymen, blood will be stuck behind and that is also seen in many other conditions. We are just coming to another slide, we'll tell you more about cryptomenorrhea. Common predisposing factor for placenta accreta is placenta previa. Please remember, placenta previa is the most common association of placenta accreta. Yes, it is also previous LSCS and it is also previous uterine, uterine surgeries. Yes. But the most common association is placenta previa. So what is the treatment of this? Yes, anybody wants to give me treatment? Screen is blurred. All right. Uh, I wish uh, that can be corrected by the backend team. I'm sure they are seeing your reviews. They'll take care of it. Don't worry. And um, what is the treatment of this placenta accreta? What will be the management of placenta accreta? Because it will. You've, you've done the delivery of the baby. You're trying to take out the placenta. Placenta is stuck. You think it's a retained placenta. You try to take it out. The cord will snap. You'll take the patient to the OT, you'll put a hand inside the uterus and you'll try to take out the placenta, it is still stuck. You'll take out bits and pieces and there'll be torrential bleeding. That is what is placenta previa presentation. Torrential bleeding and in within minutes, the patient will go into shock and probably die. So what do you have to do? Do a laparotomy and do a lot of smart suturing if you're a good surgeon. But most of the time, even if you're a good surgeon, you end up in a hysterectomy. So yes, mostly a hysterectomy is required for a placenta previa and definitely for a, uh, you know, uh, in Creta, I'm sorry, placenta accreta, I meant to say. Mostly a hysterectomy is required for a placenta accreta, also required for a placenta in Creta and placenta per Creta. All of these, you will require a hysterectomy eventually. Sometimes we are able to save, but many times we end up doing a hysterectomy, right? So that is this. Now, when we're talking about the pelvis, the smallest diameter of the pelvis is the interspinous diameter, the mid pelvis. So mid pelvis, interspinous diameter, this diameter is 10.5, 10 to 10.5. We call it the interspinous diameter. We also call it the bispinous diameter. So we know what is the diameter of the uh, broadest diameter of the baby. The broadest diameter of the baby is the biparietal diameter. So when you have the biparietal diameter, which is the broadest, and it goes to the narrowest part of the mid pelvis, that is the interspinous diameter, then the delivery is certain to happen. So that happens at plus two station. So plus one, plus two. So when the head of the baby is at plus two station, the broadest part of the head of the baby is gone to the plus uh, gone through the narrowest part of the mid pelvis. So at plus two station, when you see, when you see the vertex at plus two station, you know this delivery will happen, all right? 
Shortest diameter of the fetal head is the bimastoid diameter. Bimastoid diameter. Bitemporal diameter is not the shortest. Okay, so bimastoid is 7.5, that is the shortest, and bitemporal is 8 centimeters. Now, expected date of delivery, what is that? That is 40 weeks. That is 280 days of pregnancy or 9 months and 7 days, like we know the Nagley's formula. So, this 40 weeks or 280 days or the 9 months and 7 days. All of that is what is known as the expected date of delivery. How many percent women deliver on the expected date of delivery? I'm waiting for your answers. Let's see what you're telling me. Uh, how many? Uh... All right. Very good. Most of you know this answer. That is very good. Uh, everybody, 2% is not the best answer, 4% is correct. So only 4% people deliver on the expected date of delivery. Good, most of you got it correct. Uh, caffeine and Shrija and, uh, oh yeah, everybody, a whole lot of you. Okay, Dr. Rao is correct and so so many of you. So yes, those who are saying 4 or 5%, all of you are correct because they will give you a choice, either 4 or 5. They will not give you 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. Like that kind of choices are uh, never to be given. They have to be mutually exclusive choices. So mostly you get 4% as a choice. Only 4% deliver on the expected date of delivery. Most people deliver before this time. Alright, so 40 to 42 weeks is known as post-datism. Past dates or post-datism. And beyond 42 weeks is known as post-term. All right, then cryptomenorrhea, like I said, we'll discuss more. So cryptomenorrhea is pent up menstruation. If the uterus is having formation of the proper genital tract, everything is good. But the hymen is imperforate. This hymen is imperforate. So it's very obvious that the blood will collect here. So this blood collected here in the vagina and the uterus you know very well in the uterus it is known as hematometra in the vagina it is known as hematocolpus and this is blood which is there inside but not coming out hidden menstruation so hidden menstruation is seen in imperforate hymen it is also seen in transverse vaginal septum and vaginal atresia now the transverse vaginal septum will be much higher a transverse vaginal septum will be somewhere here transverse vaginal septum will be somewhere here all right so transvaginal septum also you'll see cryptomenorrhea, hidden periods, you'll see it in vaginal atresia and you'll see it in imperforate hymen. All right. Okay. Then uh, treatment of an imperforate hymen. Yes. What is the treatment of an imperforate hymen? So if there's an imperforate hymen like this, you will make a cruciate incision. I think in the revision chapters, I showed you the video also of a cruciate incision. Now, most common type of twin pregnancy is both vertex. So they've asked you what is the second most common. So most is both vertex and the second most common is first vertex and second breach. So both vertex is the most common and the second most common is first vertex and second breach. Twin peak sign is seen in diamniotic and dichorionic pregnancies. So twin peak sign if you see two fetus like this and the two bags and there is one placenta and you want to make sure you want to know whether there is this one placenta is actually one or two placentas which are very close so if there is actually two placentas if it is dichorionic if there are two placentas which are stuck to each other because of being just uh, being very close they in two placentas were separate and they implanted very close to each other so this placenta will be stuck to each other when these placentas are stuck to each other then there might be some chorion which will come and invaginate between these two amnions. So that is what is known as the twin peak sign. That is what is known as a twin peak sign. All right. So twin peak like this. It's like a peak or you can turn it around and you'll see it like this. Twin peak sign or even as a lambda sign. So when you see that it is diamniotic dichoronic pregnancy. And if you don't see this, if you don't see this twin peak sign, then it is a monochoronic diamniotic pregnancy and all of you know that a monochoronic pregnancy will have more problems than a diamniotic a, a monochoronic pregnancy will have more problems than a monochoronic um, i'm sorry i'm repeating uh, a wrong answer every time a monochoronic pregnancy will have more problems than a dichoronic so always remember a dichoronic pregnancy is what is required okay so let's move on and see the next question pregnancy has increased clotting factors all clotting factors increase in pregnancy 
except 11 and 13. So pregnancy is a hypercoagulable condition. So all of you know that it is very nice to have a good coagulation. So when a woman is delivering, that's why from the site of the placenta, when the placenta is removed, that site is the one which bleeds the most. And that is what causes the PPH. So nature has made a mechanism of increasing the clotting factors. And those clotting factors will make sure that the bleeding is less. What else is very wonderful? The fact that there is hemodilution in pregnancy. So one factor is that the clotting factors increase. So the bleeding which is happening in delivery, that will be uh, stopping faster because of the clot uh, uh, clotting factors have increased. Secondly, the blood which is coming out at that moment when the woman is delivering, that blood is more water than RBCs because pregnancy is a condition where the fluid increases more than the RBC increase. So what is lost is more fluid than RBCs. So wonderful assessment and wonderful arrangement by nature that the blood is thinner, it's got more fluid, so loss of fluid is more in delivery and the blood is hypercoagulable, so the bleeding stops faster when the woman delivers. It's a very good protective mechanism by the nature. Now, during pregnancy, fibrinogen increases from a rough uh, value of 300 milligrams per deciliter to 400 milligrams per deciliter and uh, vasopressor of choice in pregnancy. So what happens when you're giving um, a patient epidural analgesia or a spinal anesthesia, blood pressure drops. So what drug you used to give? Mostly ephedrine used to be given, okay, epinephrine, uh, all these were drugs, but the best drug to be given is phenylephrine. So phenylephrine is the vasopressor of choice. That is also one MCQ which has come in your exams. Okay, now what is the drug which you want to give in hyperthyroidism in pregnancy? Propyl thyroiracil, 100 to 150 milligrams thrice a day. It is safe in pregnancy throughout the pregnancy. Yes, this is also hepatotoxic. Side effect is it is hepatotoxic. Okay, but this is not teratogenic. See, we know better action is methimazole. It is given only after 12 weeks because it has got a better control, but it has got more problems of uh, congenital malformations like aplasia cutis, aplasia cutis, and it also causes coronal, coronal and esophageal atresia. That's why methimazole is given after 12 weeks. So now, if they ask you one drug, one drug which you can say it is the drug of choice for hyperthyroidism in pregnancy, then you'll have to choose between propyl thyroacyl and methimazole. And even if you know that methimazole is better than propyl thyroacyl, you will have to choose propyl thyroacyl because it can be safely given in the first trimester if they ask you one drug. Otherwise, the best plan is first trimester propyl thyroacyl and after 12 weeks, switch over to methimazole or carbimazole, right? So what is early deceleration? Early deceleration is because of head compression. It is the safest deceleration. Late deceleration is the uh, problem is placental insufficiency and it is unsafe deceleration and variable deceleration is because of cord compression it is the most common type of deceleration and it is mostly safe all right if it is recovering most deceleration start and recover within 30 seconds sometimes they can go up to one minute so if they're recovering within this, this time it is all right but if they're taking longer than a minute then we say that this variable deceleration which is causing the cord compression it is compressing the cord for a longer time longer time cord compression deceleration will be longer than uh, 30 seconds and if it goes beyond one minute two minutes sometimes then it is not safe so there are many factors to variable deceleration just remember mostly this start and recover in 30 seconds and that's why they are mostly safe it is the most common type of deceleration which is the variable deceleration so how do you see this decelerations so decelerations are seen by two bands on the uh, tummy of the mother one band is holding a doppler for the u uh, for the fetal heart rate another one is uh, holding a, uh, a tocometer that is to measure the contractions of the uterus so toco uterine contraction and the fetal heart rate both are seen together so we see the fetal heart rate which is like this and we see the uterine contraction which are going like this and with the uterine contraction if the heart rate goes low like this so peak of contraction coinciding with the lowest uh, fetal heart rate it is known as a early deceleration and if it is coming later suppose the deceleration is coming later than the contraction then we say it is a late deceleration so this is a early deceleration and this is a late deceleration all right quick revision of what all we know very well okay so when we use this when we use this i'm so happy that most of you writing when we use the uh, fetal heart rate assessment along with the uterine contraction 
it is known as the cardiotocography okay the fetal heart rate along with the uterine contraction that is what is known as a cardiotocography two probes are there and when there is one probe on the picture then please mark nst non stress test because the patient is not in labor when the picture is given to you she is not in labor we are just seeing the antepartum surveillance when there is one probe for the fetal heart rate and that is for the non stress test all right so anesthesia for cesarean section is given at t4 level and below so sensory block is should be t4 and epidural analgesia when the patient is in labor and you want to give her pain relief that should be t10 and below okay and uh, epidural analgesia two conditions you should remember we must give epidural analgesia one is you can give epidural analgesia to any woman who wants to deliver any woman who says that i want to have a painless labor you can please give her epidural analgesia when she goes into active labor so generally what we do we place the catheter when she is 2 cm to 3 cm when she is in latent phase of labor aram se we can go ahead uh, in you know uh, she is not uh, you know in too much of pain and she is cooperative so place the epidural catheter when she is not in active labor because once she is in active labor she is not going to listen to you much and she is going to be moving around much so we say place the catheter when she is around 2 to 3 cm and once she goes into active labor the gynecologist calls the anesthetist anesthetist again and now the catheter is placed they just keep the wire hanging from the chest you know they put it into the back obviously and then that wire is hung here and there's a, a small uh, aperture through which you can inject the drug and uh, that drug is injected whenever patient is having too much of pain so epidural analgesia i have patients who have been i have actually seen a patient who was reading a magazine when she was about to go into the second stage of her labor yes why i did a pervaginal examination she was 8 9 cm and she was not having any pain that i mean that kind of i mean not all of them have that kind of relief but most of them have good relief all right you can actually be reading a magazine when you are in labor that kind of relief it is there so what i'm trying to say epidural analgesia can be given to any uh, to anybody who is delivering but definitely give it for breech vaginal delivery and for heart disease so these two when they go into labor very important because breech requires good relaxation of the pelvic muscles also and we may have to give a bilateral episiotomy sometimes when a big baby with breech is coming out so give epidural analgesia and also for heart disease because pain relief is excellent with um uh, epidural analgesia and when there is pain when a woman has pain too much of pain in labor and she has a heart disease pain can precipitate a failure so that's why we said it's best that she takes epidural analgesia in heart disease and also in breech right now what are you asking me cardiac heart disease okay mostly uh, no um, no surai we don't do cesarean section for heart disease no see um, what i want to teach you guys please understand obstetrics obstetrics doesn't mean doing a cesarean for any problem which is happening in a pregnant mother if she is hypertensive she is diabetic she is previous lacs she is iugr for everything if you are going to do cesarean section then obstetrics md will take only 5 days to uh, master in 5 days you'll assist me i'll do three cesareans every day you assist me 15 cesareans by the end of fifth day sixth day you're going to say sir i'm going to do the cesarean basically what is it what is a cesarean section open the abdomen open the subcutaneous tissue open the rectus sheath reflect the bladder down cut the uterus take the baby out tie the uterus tie the peritoneum tie the rectus tie the skin that's it that's all is there in cesarean section some of our uh, nurses who are assist us and our technicians who assist us they actually have very good hands and they do cesareans unofficially i'm not saying that you cannot uh, quote me i will dis uh, own whatever i said just now so some of them are very smart they do very good cesareans but are they obstetricians so obstetrics is not doing a cesarean obstetrics is doing a normal vaginal delivery and having the art of cesarean section ready at hand when it is required in emergency yes of course there are conditions where elective cesarean is done but your job is to do a cesarean section only when it is required all women should deliver normally all right chal slide lecture ho gaya aage badhte hain so um, what about uh, incidence of breach breach is 3% at term so most common presentation is cephalic most common mal presentation is breach so it is the most common mal presentation okay now another one rare mal presentation the rare mal presentation is shoulder presentation now shoulder presentation is seen in transverse lie see in shoulder presentation try and understand this 
the baby is like this what is this presentation see the shoulder is in the lower segment so it is this is a shoulder presentation what is the lie of the baby baby is in transverse lie so be very careful sometimes we very cunningly ask you some questions which are uh, you know we asking you what is the presentation in this patient and immediately will mark it transverse lie no that is the lie presentation is shoulder presentation just a small bit of important information which you tend to miss sometimes so shoulder presentation has transverse lie now extended arms is uh, sorry the commonest cause of breech presentation is prematurity so the prematurity uh, corrects by itself in some time so that's why uh, i mean i'm sorry the prematurity when it uh, when the baby gets to term the baby corrects by himself when the lycra reduces and the head becomes heavier the head comes down so when the baby is around 30 32 weeks 33 weeks 34 35, 35 weeks and if it is a breach don't throw an alarm wait till 36 37 weeks by then the baby is big and the head is heavier so the breach corrects now extended arms is delivered by lovsets method and extended legs are delivered by pinards maneuver all right so i wish there was this form where you could teach this again but we are just telling you some facts right now now uh version external and internal we were talking about breech and transverse lie so when there is a baby which is by a breech presentation let's say the baby is by breech and you don't want to do a breech vagina delivery you know that breech will have more injuries versus a baby by cephalic so when we want to turn the baby when we want to turn the baby we can turn the baby from a trans abdominal maneuver which is known as an external cephalic uh, version so that is done at 36 weeks in a primary and at 37 weeks in a multi internal podalic version now internal podalic version you cannot do internal podalic version when the patient is in labor when internal means you put your hand inside the uterus when can you put your hand inside the uterus when the cervix is totally dilated when the cervix is totally dilated when she is in advanced labor so you cannot put your hand inside and turn a baby because the uterus will rupture with the turn so when can you do internal podalic version that one condition when you put your hand inside the uterus through the vagina into the cervix you put your hand inside and when you turn the baby the uterus is relaxed that uterus will be relaxed only in a case of when there is one baby delivered and the second baby is in transverse lie between two labors the uterus is relaxed you know this question is asked in many forums and most of you confuse yourself with the answer why can you do ipv for a second of twin in transverse lie because when one baby delivers the second baby will take some time to come out and in this time the uterus is relaxed so you can put your hand and turn the baby in a second of a twin with transverse lie that's the only condition all right now ipv can do in the second of twin in transverse lie that is fine we've already discussed let's move and see transverse lie in labor do a cesarean section when a baby is in transverse lie and she's come in labor do not think of external cephalic version or internal podalic version nothing internal podalic version just now i told you second of twin in transverse lie now transverse lie in labor do a cesarean section now plasma previa bleeding at term no problem do a cesarean section bro cesarean section so this is why i wanted to give you three informations which are very important bro transverse lie in labor and plasma previa which is bleeding at term these three go ahead and mark cesarean section please mark the question transverse lie in labor don't think of internal or external podalic version a transverse lie can be made a cephalic presentation but that is when the pregnancy is not in labor when the woman is 36 37 weeks all right okay now face presenting part when the face is the presenting part that is uh, you must know presentations are what cephalic presentation breech presentation shoulder presentation now in this cephalic presentations depending on the attitude of the head there might be a vertex there might be a brow or there might be a face so face presenting part can be seen in vertex and face will deliver because the diameter of engagement so face presenting part excuse me face presenting part the diameter of engagement is sub mento pragmatic which is 9.5 cm and when it is 9.5 cm it is same as the sub occipito pragmatic which is there in a vertex presentation so face will deliver mento anterior will deliver now 
if mento posterior is there in the pelvis mento posterior if it rotates to mento anterior that will also deliver but if it stays mento posterior you will have to do a cesarean section please mark my words face will deliver only when face is mento anterior when face is mento posterior it has to rotate to anterior to deliver if it rotates it will deliver but if it stays if it stays persistent persistent mento posterior when it stays persistent mento posterior then the diameter becomes sternobregmatic so that sternobregmatic sternobregmatic is 9 is 17.5 is 17 or 17.5 centimeters so you will have to do a cesarean section so mental posture only if it becomes mental anterior you can think in terms of doing a delivery all right good uh, so in phase which is the most common mega is asking me left mental anterior correct mental anterior is the best and in that left mental anterior is the commonest that is correct question i mean correct answer to your question preeclampsia pathogenesis preeclampsia is a two stage disorder please remember now we are asking you a lot about preeclampsia i have tried to give you some pictures in this small uh, uh, you know uh, revision kind of a class also there are two stage disorder the first stage is faulty placentation okay faulty placentation means the villi villi which has these blood vessels and these blood vessels are invaded and replaced by trophoblast so now this happens after 20 weeks this is what is known as a normal thing so the spiral arteries the spiral arteries will be replaced by the uh, the smooth muscle in the spiral arteries will be replaced by the trophoblast and when the spiral arteries have no muscle left because trophoblast has replaced the muscle so but the muscles will be vasodilated vasodilated vessels will give more better perfusion this is normal it happens at 20 weeks now if it doesn't happen at 20 weeks blood pressure increases after 20 weeks so every time we say that PIH is blood pressure high after 20 weeks why because 20 weeks later after 20 weeks the mother has a placenta which is modified and this is natural to modify and there's a very good vasodilation in the placenta to give good perfusion to the baby now if it, this doesn't happen the blood pressure increases after 20 weeks so that's why the blood pressure high after 20 weeks is known as gestational hypertension okay so stage one of this two stage disorder stage one is faulty placentation which was uh, which i told you just now the poor poor trophoblastic invasion of the smooth muscle layer in spiral arteries so if this is not happening then the patient will have this faulty placentation now stage two is the maternal syndrome maternal syndrome is what there is endothelial activation one is that the placenta is not formed properly vessels are narrow and then there is endothelial activation which results in vasospasm so there will be increase in increase in vasodilators increase in vaso uh, constrictors i'm sorry and decrease in vasodilators so increase in vasoconstrictors like angiotensin 2 thromboxin a2 endothelin and decrease in vasodilators like uh, uh, PGI2 which is prostacyclin and nitric oxide so increase in vasoconstrictors decrease in vasodilators you've been hearing about it now all of this has been put into a two-part theory stage one is the poor placentation and stage two is the endothelial activation or the maternal syndrome all right so what happens in addition to that now there are some um, angiogenic factors something uh, which is required for the blood vessels to become uh, nice and dilated so angiogenic factors in the placenta are good of course you know you keep talking about anti-angiogenic factors in the eye when 20 weeks and beyond if that angiogenesis doesn't happen anti-angiogenic factors if they come in then the placentation is not good and the perfusion is not good so mother increases the blood pressure to overcome this what happens that increase in you see and in preeclampsia you see the soluble endoglin the soluble endoglin and the uh, the SFLD1 they are binding to the transforming growth factor and they are binding to the vascular endothelial growth factor and not allowing the normal angiogenesis 
All right, this uh, diagram is becoming uh, very uh, important for your exams. Please read about it. I've discussed this in the revision class also around one week back. Please go ahead and see the video once more. More detail in that one. Now, expected management in plasma previa, when a patient is bleeding before 34 weeks of gestation. Before 34 weeks of gestation, if the patient is bleeding with a plasma previa, I am in a fix because if the baby is preterm and the baby is going to be removed by a cesarean, I'm a little worried. So I give steroids and I, I hope that I can buy some time. But what is a wonderful thing that if you give conservative management in a case of placenta previa, which is bleeding, most of the times, 90% of times the bleeding stops. So expected management placenta previa is known as McAfee-Johnson regime. 90% cases, the bleed will stop. All right, bleed stops. Now, Vasa Previa has fetal bleeding. Vasa Previa is seen in a placenta which has a vella mentis cord. Vella mentis cord, which is over the internal os. Vella mentis cord over the internal os. All right, you know that very well. But I'm just reminding you, Vasa Previa has fetal bleeding and more than 50% of cases there is mortality more than 50 percent mortality by vasa previa so to distinguish whether this blood which is coming out of the mother it is fetal blood or the metal blood you have to do the ab test this is the alkaline denaturation alkaline denaturation of the rbcs will happen if you take this blood and put it into a, 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 a test tube and then you add the sodium hydroxide this sodium hydroxide will make the RBCs colorless. Why? Because the hemoglobin will have alkaline denaturation. So that alkaline denaturation is the reason why the RBCs become colorless. That is uh, the metal RBCs. But if it is fetal RBCs, they will stay red. So if they are colorless, if they become colorless, then they are maternal RBCs. And if they are still red, then they are fetal RBCs. So this is to distinguish. All right. Now, Something similar happens in RHI summarization where I want to distinguish the mothers and the fetal blood. No, I want to find out exactly how much of fetal blood is there in the maternal circulation because I want to give the appropriate amount of anti-D in a RH negative mother who has delivered a RH positive baby. All right. So uh, when a mother delivers, her uh, blood circulation may get contaminated by the fetal blood. So that fetal blood can be seen in the maternal circulation. And I take the maternal blood and put it on a slide and wash it with acid. So acid elution test, which is also known as the Klee-Hoyer, Klee-Hoyer Betke test, Klee-Hoyer Betke test or the acid elution test. Clear habit kit test or the acid elution test is the one which is done for finding out whether uh, finding out exactly how much of uh, fetal blood has gone into the maternal circulation. So this feto maternal hemorrhage exactly what amount this is known as the KB test and this is a quantitative exactly how much of blood and the ab test is a qualitative test. What is the difference? I mean whether it is maternal blood or fetal blood. Just differentiating qualitative test. Finding out how much blood has gone from the fetus to the mother, quantitative. All right. Classification of severity of absorption is by Page's classification. Sure and Page, Dr. Sure and Dr. Page. But Dr. Page's name keeps coming more frequently in your exams. These are MCQs. So uh, you should know McAfee Johnson for conservative management of plasma previa. First episode of plasma previa stops bleeding in 90% of cases. Classification of absorption given by Sure and Page. App test to find out exact amount. Uh, app test done to find out whether it's maternal blood or fetal blood. And if it is fetal blood, in a case of vasa previa, immediate cesarean section has to be done to save the baby. And then clear hair bed kit test is to find out exactly how much of fetal blood has gone to the metal circulation. So a lot of names they keep coming in exams. I'm sure you know about them. I'm just doing a quick revision for you guys. Move on. So. Um, Preeclampsia is more than simply gestational hypertension with proteinuria, but the appearance of proteinuria remains a primary diagnostic criteria. Very important. At mid 
uh, you know, at mid discussion at uh, point number 50, I wanted to give you a fact which is straight from Williams Obstetrics. No contribution from me. This is very, very important because uh, I know some of you have been asking me that has proteinuria been removed out of the uh, diagnosis of preeclampsia uh, pre or preeclampsia syndrome or we also call it the preeclamptic toxemia. No, please, proteinuria stays. This is latest Williams 26th edition. It has not been changed in 25th edition or even the 26th edition. There are a lot of journals which keep saying many things and I've told you many times please don't bank on journals for your information latest guidelines what is it and what are the major things happening in the royal college or the american college guys even as gynecologists we have so much of confusion when we are managing so one hospital is a royal college uh, you know based hospital another hospital will be american college like i think amazonians they like to follow american uh, guidelines more and the uh, traditional hospitals i will not name them the ones which are uh, you know traditionally set up by the british and we were under the British, they follow a lot of Royal College guidelines. But we cannot put them into practice just because Royal College has come out with a new guideline day before yesterday. We have to put them in practice only when your hospitals put them into practice. That's the difference. So if it comes on the internet, it is not your business. If it comes in a book, it is important for you. Okay, convulsions in a pregnancy can be because of uh, many reasons. So epilepsy is a disorder which you guys know neurology better than me. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder which causes convulsions. But convulsions is also a manifestation of eclampsia. So convulsion in pregnancy, please be careful what we are asking you. If we are asking you drug of choice for epilepsy which causes convulsion, then we say Lamotrigin. But I'm talking about eclampsia sometimes. Drug of choice for eclampsia, that is magnesium sulfate. So be careful when you mark your answers. Avoid diazepam for the acute control of a convulsion in pregnancy. Diazepam is a benzodiazepine and it is known to cause. Mother will stop the convulsion very nicely, we know that. But that diazepam is definitely known to cause fetal hypoxia. So those who are doing internship right now, they would have seen. In most of the medical colleges, your consultants will tell you, please don't give diazepam. When a patient convulses, the first drug and the best drug is magnesium sulfate. And the drug to reduce the blood pressure is levetolol IV. All right? Fine. Let's see. Mirror syndrome, also known as Ballantine's disease or also the triple edema. So everybody's edematous. The fetus has hydrosphetalis. The mother is edematous because she's got preeclamptic toxemia and the plasma is also edematous. So every everything is edematous. So triple edema, Ballantine's disease or mirror syndrome. Why mirror? The mother mirrors the uh, hydrops of the baby. Mother is also swollen. Baby is also swollen. Is known as the mirror syndrome. All right. Is this helpful for FMG? Please, FMG guys, please don't think you're any different from the PG entrance guys anymore. Your questions have been coming tougher than the PG entrance for the very uh, for the last two years easily. And hello, maybe you have another six months left where there might be some easy questions being asked. You know, this is going to be recorded and I think you FMG students will be reading this even next year or the year after because you're doing revisions like I keep telling you. So if you're reading it in let's say 2025, by now the next is already here and next exam is going to be same for the um, MBBS students and for the FMG students and also for the PG entrance students. So guys this uh, idea of reading somewhat lesser and lesser complicated because we are FMG please get out of that guys and you are just as tough as anybody else and I'm sure that you're reading just as hard. So please read hard so that these exams become easier for you. So simple isn't it? Chal, most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atony and most common cause of secondary PPH is retained bits of placenta and uterine atony you know the drug of choice is oxytocin and for secondary PPH the treatment is curettage and we discussed about curettage which is done for secondary PPH is more likely to cause Escherman syndrome than curettage done for any other cause all right new addition to drugs for PPH control carbitocin yes this question came uh, last last year Carbitocin, you give 100 micrograms of carbitocin in 1 ml solution over 1 minute. So this is what is carbitocin injection and tranosamic acid is also given 1 gram IV to control bleeding. These are the new drugs which are used regularly now. They are coming in your exams. Now some drugs which are purported, maybe neat exam 
you guys uh, please be on the lookout uh, they have not come in williams so far but they're in the discussion for a long time almost four five years now so melatonin causes uh, smooth muscle contraction vasos present is known to cause contraction of the uh, vascular smooth muscles and cause a vasoconstriction to stop the bleeding and also the anti-arrhythmic drug which is known as the dofitilide are next in line to be recommended for the management of PPH. So please be on the lookout for these three drugs. What is the these three drugs use in obstetrics for? Maybe that might be a question and that is that they are used for the management of postpartum hemorrhage. All right. Um, which drug is the most effective? Now that is a very good question because uh, drug of choice is oxytocin and carbitocin is longer acting and uh, we know that this is a newer drug which is used. But the drug of choice is oxytocin, but the drug which we bank on, nothing works. I mean, oxytocin, I've tried, I've tried carbitocin, I've tried even, let's say, uh, mesoprostol and methylogometrin, nothing is working. So the go-to drug, yes, that is carbopros, PGF2 alpha. So that uh, question which one of my friend asked, uh, uh, XYZ, um, okay, XYZ, I hope you got your answer. Uh, lovely name, you have XYZ, uh, great to know you, you're around, and uh, I hope your best friend is ABC. Okay, so dofe, dofe tilide promotes uterine contraction through inhibition of the HERG channels, very uh, uh, a go go channels like that. They keep telling this. So, please, uh, I know you guys have been reading about this, and uh, uh, her HERG channels are inhibited, that's why there is uh, smooth muscle contractions. Okay, let's move on and see. This slide is given sponsored by Dr. Prasanvich and uh, those who don't like what I teach, I keep trying to force myself on you by any moment, uh, any opportunity I get by forcing this. In fact, uh, it's uh, a correct thing to do, but I keep saying that I'm forcing myself on you. Please don't mind, but please do you try and massage and active management of third stage of labor because this question came in your need exam, the last need exam. If they, they have asked you to arrange this um, uh, the, the things which you do in the active management of third stage of labor, please arrange them in the correct order. So you have to arrange them for in correct order. So you, after the delivery of the mother, uh, the first baby, you check if there's a second baby, check for oxytocin, I mean, give oxytocin 10 units, do a control contraction to take out the placenta, and then you do a uterine massage. So they asked you the order of doing these things. So this is obviously A, B, C, and D. Answer is A. Why did I show you this MCQ? Just to tell you that they are asking you how to put uterine massage in the right order of scheme of things. So that means they have to do uterine massage. That's why they're asking you the order. Why are they asking you to say that we don't do uterine massage, but put it in the right order? Guys, uterine massage is done. It is done in all the hospitals in the country and definitely medical colleges they do it. And all your labor rooms, those who are working interns, you would have seen, they do uterine massage. And the protocol stuck in front of the labor room, when you enter the labor room, they'll tell you PPH management. And I'm sure that they've written uterine massage there. So guys, do not have any doubts. Uterine massage is done. And I don't care what is written in WHO manual 2012 and 2018. I know you guys are reading it. I would have also read it, right? But go ahead and do uterine massage. It is done. In fact, your William says still early cord clamping. But aren't you saying delayed cord clamping? Yes, aren't you saying that? So early cord clamping and delayed cord clamping are not the most important part of active management of third stage of labor. This MCQ has also come once, but in when it was PG entrance exam in PGI Chandigarh. They asked you one question that which of these is not a very important part of active management of third of labor. Whether you do early cord clamping or a delayed cord clamping, it doesn't affect the PPH too much. But yes, what you should be doing if they ask you about cord clamping, delayed cord clamping, 60 seconds and more, so that the hemoglobin of the baby increases by one gram per cent. All right, pediatricians will hate you if you do a early cord clamping. But it is mentioned early cord clamping in Williams. So what are you going to contradict? Williams? So yes. A book like Williams is contradicted by all of us because we now do delayed cord clamping. So please go and answer what is done in the medical colleges or what is, uh, what is taught to you by your teachers and what we teachers are trying to teach you because we know what is being taught there. So that's why it is important. All of us are teachers in, uh, you know, I teach postgraduates. I'm in a, I'm in a hospital. I'm, I'm an examiner for some exams. I wish I could tell you that. Uh, but you must understand that these are the things which are asked. What is practice is asked. What is written in so many uh, sources online is not always the information which you should be reading. So we have uh, used this time and let's move on. 
नो मो मेगा कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी ओवर खत्म नो 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 कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी यू विल डू यू ट्रैंड मसाज खत्म ना दैट्स इट वाई यू हैविंग अ कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी यू हर्ड इट फ्रॉम मी एंड आई एम वर्किंग एज एन ऑब्सट्रेशन एंड गैनकोलॉजिस्ट एंड यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू हेर इट एन खत्म बात दैट्स इट ओके फिफ्टी एट अ पेशेंट आफ्टर डिलीवरी इज इन शॉक नाउ दिस ऑल्सो सम चैट वॉज देयर अबाउट दिस नाउ वॉट इज हैपनिंग इफ I say a mother delivers and she goes into shock immediately. So, what was the question? Nobody knows what was the exact language. So, I've given you three combinations which came in the exams. If the patient goes into shock, most common cause of patient going into shock after delivery, she bleeds and she goes into shock. So that is postpartum hemorrhage, unexplained shock. That is, she delivers and there is no blood loss. I mean, there is normal blood loss, no PPH. Still, she goes into shock and dies. That is what is known as amniotic fluid embolism. Patient dies in a snap. very very sad i am not a fluid embolism i have seen a lot of cases in my life and a lot is like around 15 to 20 odd cases around that number that's a lot in a lifetime because uh, fortunately it is not very common but most of these patients we lost it's very very unfortunate i don't think uh, i i really don't remember which one we saved because i think one or two patients survived but uh, that was uh, maybe we diagnosed it wrong that's what i think I don't think they were amniotic fluid embolisms because the ones which were proven, they all died. But yes, the data says the um, uh, the death with amniotic fluid embolism is more than fifty percent. They don't say it is hundred percent. But yes, I'm talking about my practice where I've seen where I've worked in major hospitals in this country. Most of these patients they end up uh, on the wrong side of life. Anyway, guys, there was this very very mean question asked around two years back in a major exam, and that was a woman. has a delivery conducted by intern and the patient goes into shock after delivery what is the cause extremely mean question and this came all of you know this question came because uh, intern has done the delivery so maybe the intern did not do control cord traction and he yanked on the cord and the placenta was pulled with the uterus when it was attached to the uterus and the uterus caused an inversion very mean uh, question so if intern does a delivery it will cause an inversion so uh, i mean that's the only logical uh, answer i could gather in those choices but i'm very sure all the interns are working very hard and all of you are sitting in some other uh, forum where you reading i mean re uh, i mean re reading all what you've done in your mbbs and you in some other major forum where you are reading this and i'm sure that you guys are better than what was mentioned in this mcq they should not uh, make judgments like this for any any class of people anyway this question had come let's go and see question number 59 um please management of inversion okay inversion inversion the best thing what you can do is uh when the uterus comes out put your hand and push it back inside so this is the uterus and it has got inverted it has come out like this out of the vagina this is the vaginal opening the uterus is out like this so with your fist suppose this is my hand with my fist i'm going to push this inside back into the body of the mother so that is done under anesthesia because it's extremely painful and you relax the uterus relax the uterus with turbotalin give her general anesthesia push the uterus back inside with your fist and once it goes inside then you contract the uterus with oxytocin so that is what is done relax to push it back inside and give oxytocin to contract it that is a manual reposition or you can slowly fill the vagina with saline and the saline will it fills up the vagina it will pull up the uterus inside and the uterus will go back to its place so that is the hydrostatic method or known as o sullivan's method so manual reposition or the hydrostatic known as o sullivan's there are some surgical methods also but we'll move on embryo transfer on day 5 uh, sorry embryo transfer on day 3 is known as the eight cell stage and we put two or three embryos because day 3 embryos Uh, if you put uh, maybe one or two will implant but if you put day 5 embryos which are known as blastocysts they have lived 5 days in the lab they are better quality embryos that's why they survive to 5 days and comfortably made a blastocyst so they are strong embryos so when you put these embryos into the uterus chance of implantation is much higher so if you're putting blastocysts then put less of one or two okay so why am i saying this that when you put more number 
then we're hoping at least one will stick but sometimes all three may stick so it may cause triplets but in a day three triplets happening is very very rare i've been putting three embryos of day three all my life and i've yet to have triplets i mean yet to have triplets in my patient because it is uh, i've always had singletons or uh, twins i've yet to have triplets which have been uh, conceived by my treatment when when i put three it's so rare but yes, uh, we've had uh, triplets coming to us for management. That, of course, I've seen quadruplets also in my life. But triplets with uh, three embryo transfers is extremely rare. It's not that all three will stick. If you're not doing a good judgment, if there's a very healthy woman, a healthy man, and you're doing IVF because you're short on your fuse and you don't want to do normal treatment of infertility, you want to do IVF first, and she would have conceived even with just giving her fertile period advice. So that kind of a couple, if you do quick IVF, I mean, there's not an indicated IVF. You do an IVF for a woman and a man who are essentially healthy, and that woman, if you put three embryos, all three will stick. So those kind of triplets end up with us when we have to manage them in big institutes. So, Otherwise, I've yet to have triplets because these are indicated cases. They have not healthy endometriums, not healthy eggs, not healthy sperms. So implantation rate won't be 100%. So you put three, one or two will implant. So that's why, why I told you this story that I've never had triplets because we're doing indicated IVF. IVF required for the couple for some reason. If I do IVF for everybody, then I'll have, you put three, I'll have three embryos implanting and there'll be triplets to everybody. So yes, the last line is important. You must be saying, why is he talking about triplets so much? Because singleton or twins is accepted. A mother gets pregnant and she has a baby, she's happy. She gets two and she's like, oh, okay, chalo, I have two, I'm so happy. And uh, now my family is complete, I have two children, boy, boy, girl, girl, whatever combination. But if she has three, obstetrically it's not good because she can abort all three of them or she can go into preterm labor, nursery stay and all that. And bringing up three kids together, well, go and ask the parents who are bringing up a singleton, and then they have to pick up three people, uh, three children together. It's not so easy. So at all levels, it's a problem. So it's this triplets and beyond. Triplets and beyond is known as a complication of IVF. All right. So that's what I've written here. Okay. Can we give clomphenicitride in a fertile woman who wants to have twins? Uh, not really. We don't do that. Uh, On-demand twins? No. I mean, if you're doing that, then it is unethical. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, for all of this, uh, you know, gimmicks in management. So we'll discuss about this some other forum. We are doing a revision today. And uh, contraception used by couples meeting occasionally. Uh, uh, upon it is coming in the discussion. It is just coming. All of this is there. That's why it's a quick revision. Embryo reduction in triplets and more is done at 11 to 13 weeks. So if there are triplets, you know, sometimes these triplets come, we do reduction of these embryos and we uh, put potassium chloride into the heart of the fetus and we put it with a needle through the uh, transvaginal method or a transabdominal method, whichever one is more uh, feasible at that moment. And we put potassium chloride and the baby dies. And the other two babies will keep growing and this baby will slowly, slowly get totally plastered fetus paparaceous like you say and it will not grow and it will get necros and mostly doing a termination fetal termination is not detrimental to the other two fetus mostly okay so this termination is done at 11 to 13 weeks now why 11 to 13 weeks you can see the heartbeat at even at six weeks but why wait till 11 to 11 to 13 weeks you can do the ntnb scan so this is after the ntnb scan so if you've done the nuchal translucency and nasal bone assessment and if it is fine there are three babies and out of three babies these two babies are looking perfectly healthy the formation of the baby is fine and the ntnb scan is good and the third baby is having the baby which is not looking the best that's the baby which is terminated okay so which is obviously the best two ones will be safe IV twins are always dichronic damnotic if i'm putting twins if i'm putting two embryos they're two different embryos they'll implant and there are two different embryos, diachronic, diagnostic. But please, that's why I said almost. Sometimes you put uh, two embryos, only one implant. That one can split before three days and implant. Or it can split three days to uh, uh, eight days also. So when it splits before three days, it'll again give you diachronic, diagnostic. But if it splits from three days to eight days, it'll give you monochronic, diagnostic. So this can also happen. Splitting of a single embryo can happen even in IVF, but that's rare. Most babies, most twins with IVF are diachronic and diamniotic. So some more information. Twins in natural pregnancy, most common are dizygotic. One in 60 to one in 80 pregnancies. Dizygotic twins are always diachronic diamniotic, 100%. Monozygotic can be diachronic diamniotic in 30% of cases. So monochronic can be diachronic diamniotic 
if they split before how many days if they split before three days of life before three days if they split less than equal to three days if they split then they can be diachronic damnotic even in a monozygotic pregnancy so what is important zygosity is important or chorionicity is important please remember chorionicity is what is important on the ultrasound so we do a chorionicity chorionicity scan a chorionicity scan at 12 to 13 weeks and it shows diachronic damnotic then that is the best kind of picture you can have for an obstetrician because these are safer twins to have when it is monochronic more complications are there as we know very well so diachronic damnotic 12 to 13 weeks if you see that is what is a coronary CT scan it is seen in 100 percent cases of dizygotic twins and 30 percent cases of monozygotic twins all right now what are you asking me why put acidity when they're meeting oh well i'm coming to this doctor Sanjeev uh, Narwaria, we are coming to this, we are coming to this, just wait a minute, all of this discussion is there. Now, when I see a gestational site, there are three things which are all very important, there is a pregnancy in this uterus, I see a gestational sac, after gestation sac, a yolk sac, and after yolk sac, a fetal node. This is what is normal progress in a pregnancy. Now, you do an ultrasound, you see a gestational sac of more than 25 millimeter. This is more than 25 millimeter. And there is no yolk sac and there is no fetal pore. That means it is not a viable pregnancy. This is not going to be a pregnancy which is going to continue. Now you see a gestational sac and you see a yolk sac which is more than 6 millimeters. This without a fetal node this is also not going to survive so normal yolk sac is four to five millimeters and more than six millimeter is a very big yolk sac and that is not a healthy yolk sac so that means this pregnancy is not going to survive and if you see a fetus i'm so sorry if you see a uterus which has a gestation sac with a yolk sac and a fetal node and a fetal node which is more than seven millimeters this is seven millimeters and there's no cardiac activity then this is also not going to survive so three things which come as mcqs so i think your radiologist friends will teach you even better the three things which come in your practice one is that a gestation sac is too big 25 millimeters and bigger and it is not showing anything besides a gestation sac that is not going to make it it's called a blight rule and if you see a gestation sac and a yolk sac but there's no fetal node and the yolk sac is already seven mill six millimeters and more then that is also not going to be a viable pregnancy and if you see a fetal node you see a fetus being formed but the fetus is more than seven millimeter and there's no cardiac activity then again it is a case where it's not going to be a viable pregnancy Shall we? let's move on and see most common site of an ectopic pregnancy is ampulla and earliest rupture is isthmic so isthmic ruptures at four to six weeks ampullary ruptures at six to eight weeks and most common rupture most common rupture is obviously the ones which is more common 70 percent of rupture ectopic is ampullary rupture 11 10 to 11 percent is isthmic rupture i don't know why sometimes you people ask me sir we know that isthmic is the commonest to rupture not at all isthmic is only 11 percent rupture most common is which one ampullary so most common rupture is also ampullary as simple as that all right and um, ampullary rupture six to eight weeks isthmic ruptures four to six weeks earliest to rupture that is correct last to rupture is the interstitial or the cornual ectopic the ectopic which is at this part of the fallopian tube here this is known as cornual interstitial because this will grow with the uterus the pregnancy grows and the uterus is a muscle which will grow in pregnancy this will go on it is the narrowest part of the tube the interstitial part is the narrowest part but the uterus is over this part of the tube so as the baby grows the uterus also stretches and that's why it ruptures the last 12 to 16 weeks last to rupture 12 to 16 weeks right fate of an ectopic what happens to an ectopic pregnancy rupture not at all tubal abortion second most common but the most common event which happens with the ectopic pregnancy that an ectopic pregnancy grows too big for the tube and the blood supply the tube gets stretched and the blood supply stops and the baby dies once the baby dies the placenta dies the hcg reduces 
and then the corpus from the ovary dies because HCG is gone. And when the corpus from uh, degenerates, the endometrium sheds. So yes, bleeding per vaginam in an ectopic pregnancy is due to the shedding of the decidua. All right, I don't want anybody to say that, sir, in a rupture ectopic, the tube is ruptured and there is a lot of blood in the abdomen and it goes through the tube, goes through the abdomen, uh, goes through the uterus and comes out like this and starts bleeding. Please don't say this, okay? This is not the cause of bleeding in a ectopic. Ectopic bleeds because the pregnancy in the tube dies, HCG reduces and the corpus rum dies. And when the corpus rum dies, the progesterone production reduces and this endometrium will shed and that causes the bleeding, all right? So vascular insufficiency is the most common cause of, the most common fate of an ectopic, that is the ectopic dies because of vascular insufficiency and the endometrium sheds to cause vaginal bleeding. So that's the triad all of you know, uh, amenorrhea for some time, pain abdomen and vaginal bleeding. That's the triad of a ectopic pregnancy. Most common cause of an ectopic is PID and most important cause is previous ectopic. Please don't say previous ectopic is the most common cause of an ectopic. I mean, I don't know. This beats logic at all levels. I mean, if a woman had an ectopic and she comes to me, she says, sir, I'm pregnant for the first time. I got married last month and I'm pregnant this month itself. Or let's say two months I'm pregnant. And I do the ultrasound and say, oh, you have an ectopic. And she says, sir, how did I have an ectopic? What am I going to say? Or oh, because you had an ectopic before this, that's why you had an ectopic. I mean, this beats, beats logic at all levels. Come on, guys. She's pregnant for the first time and she has an ectopic. That's because she has PID. Or she has some other problem like endometriosis or tuberculosis. <laughs> it's not because of previous ectopic. Previous ectopic is the most important cause of an ectopic. I agree that if a woman had an ectopic, one ectopic, the next one is 15%. And if she had two ectopics, if she's had two ectopic pregnancy, the next one is 30% chance of an ectopic. So once an ectopic, next time, please rule out an ectopic pregnancy whenever she conceives. I agree with that. It's the most important cause of an ectopic, but not the commonest. Okay, so what are you guys saying? So yes, please clear this one once again. Please remember, if a woman has an ectopic for, I mean, she gets pregnant and she has an ectopic, it is because of some problems in the tube, anatomy of the tube, or infections in the tube, or uh, adhesions of the tube. That is the cause of an ectopic. You can't say that if a woman is pregnant for the first time, suppose a woman is pregnant for the first time and she has an ectopic pregnancy, what is the cause she's going to ask you? What are you going to tell her? You're going to tell her it's because you had an ectopic before this one, previous ectopic. Because you somehow think that most common cause of an ectopic is a repeat ectopic. No men. What are you going to tell that woman that you have an ectopic because you had an ectopic before this and she'll say, sir, I'm married only two months back. I've never been pregnant before this. How can I have a previous ectopic as a cause of this one when I'm pregnant for the first time? That's what I'm trying to make you understand. Okay, so uh, please listen to this, rewind and play again and I'm sure you'll understand. Actually, let's move forward. IUCD, please, does not increase as ectopic. IUCD reduces pregnancies. So obviously reduces ectopic pregnancy. Okay, if at all she conceives, then relative chance of the baby going to the fallopian tube is slightly more. So, pregnancy with IUCD, it is intrauterine in 95 to 96% still. It is, it is ectopic, it is ectopic in 5 to 6% cases. Otherwise, what is the incidence of ectopic? In normal women who conceive, it is 1 to 2 percent is the incidence of ectopic pregnancy in normal women. Those who get pregnant with an IUCD in C2, the chance of an ectopic is 5 to 6 percent. But first of all, they will not conceive with an IUCD. What, I mean, if a woman takes an IUCD, I mean, I am putting an IUCD for a woman. She comes to me, with me for contraception. One of the favorite long-term reversible contraception is IUCD. You put it five years, fill it and forget it. Now put an IUCD and she asked me, sir, uh, now there's no problem, right? Sir, I'll not conceive. And everything is fine, right, sir? I say everything is fine. And is going to happen to me? No, nothing's going to happen to you. No, there could be some side effects. Yeah, I have uh, given you an IUCD and you're going to have an ectopic pregnancy, it's going to rupture and you're going to die. You think she's going to take an IUCD with me if I say this? You think that is correct if I say that? That she's going to have more ectopics? I mean, please use your uh, common sense. If I put an IUCD, and that is going to increase an ectopic pregnancy. Why will I put an IFCD? 
it is not going to increase an ectopic it is going to reduce pregnancies obviously if pregnancies are less ectopics will be less okay if at all she conceives with an IOCD, the pregnancy will still be in the uterus just that the chance of an ectopic pregnancy is slightly more than five to six percent as compared to a woman who gets pregnant just without an IOCD, which is one to two percent again rewind and listen to this i'm sure you'll understand so progesterone only pills same logic this logic it reduces pregnancy so it actually reduces ectopic but if at all she conceives with the progesterone only pill rule out an ectopic pregnancy so i hope uh, most of you got this consider but most common cause most common cause is PID. I'm sure it is PID, okay? It is not a previous ectopic. Okay, Dr. Anvi. Relative contraindication of an IOCD is just coming next screen. You know, it's all these are very interesting questions which I encounter by students uh, throughout my teaching all over the year. So, yes, that is also a question. It's coming. I'm, I'm already splitting uh, in my head with a laugh. But never mind, we'll come back to that. So surgical management of an ectopic pregnancy is indicated if it is too big, more than four centimeters, if the HCG is very high, more than 5,000, and if the cardiac action is present. If it is uh, less than this, then we do medical management. If uh, any of these is positive, if that uh, size is big and the HCG is high, or the cardiac activity is present, we go and do a surgical management. And the best surgical management is, best surgery, best surgery is linear salpingostomy. Linear sal pin go stormy all right so first parameter to be affected by intrauterine growth restriction is the abdominal circumference and the last parameter to be affected by the IUGR process is the fetal head brain sparing effect so that's why when we say first trimester second trimester and third trimester please remember these two lines line 80 and line 81 please remember these two lines that the first parameter to be affected is the abdominal circumference and the last to be affected by IUGR process is the, uh, the head diameters so if i ask you what are the single best parameters to assess the gestational age of a pregnant mother single best parameter she does not know her gestational age what is the single best parameter so first trimester it is the crown rump length the second trimester is the bipartial diameter and the third trimester it is not femoral length guys it is not femoral length it is again the bipartial diameter or the head circumference or the transcerebellar diameter and not the femoral length because femoral length first the abdominal circumference will be affected by UGR if at all she has one Next, the femoral length and the humoral length will be affected and the last to be affected will be the head diameters. So the head diameters will be the closest to the exact gestational age because even if the mother has a growth restriction happening in the fetus, the last parameter will be affected in the fetus is the diameters of the head. All right. So I'm sure that you guys will understand this. Now, um, okay, most of you are answering what I said and Karthik, I hope you listen to what I said just now and you'll... Uh, you'll have you'll concur with what i told you just now okay gdm is high sugars after 24 weeks and gestation hypertension preeclampsia is high blood pressure after 20 weeks so since gdm happens after 24 weeks oreogenesis completes at 12 weeks so gdm does not cause anomalies please remember gdm no anomalies please i think i'm breaking a heart breaking the heart of a lot of doctors here today yes pre-existing diabetes causes anomalies if a mother is pregnant and at seven weeks she has high sugars that time the organs are forming so pre-existing diabetes over diabetes in pregnancy causes anomalies gestation diabetes mellitus which the sugars increase after 24 weeks only how can that cause anomalies fetus is already completely formed by 12 weeks only the sizes the size of all the organs are now increasing and becoming better uh, in uh, uh, you know diameters and things that is what is happening after 12 weeks but till 12 weeks all the organs are formed right so I hope you got that uh, specific anomalies. Yes, specific anomalies for uh, you know uh, diabetes in pregnancy. If a mother has diabetes in which is pre-existing, it can cause anomalies. And the specific uh, anomalies for them, for the cardiac uh, cause, cardiac anomalies are more common. And the cardiac are transmission grade vessels. And then there is also sacralogenesis. So these are specific anomalies because of pre-existing diabetes in the mother out of these two also which is more common between sacralogenesis and transmission of great arteries transmission of great arteries is even more common than sacralogenesis i've seen around around 30 odd cases of transmission of great arteries in my life but i've seen only one case of sacralogenesis 
and that was in one of my classes one student came to me and said that uh, i'll not say male or female nothing i'm going to comment somebody came and said i have sacral genesis the person was perfectly fine and there was some problem and the person just told me that so that sacral genesis was the only case which i know which i did not see in my practice but in my classes so sacral genesis not um, if i'm having a experience of 26 27 years of uh, my md and beyond so uh, I have not seen one case of sacral genesis in my day-to-day -day life, but I've seen around 30 odd cases of transmission of great arteries. I think you should take that as a information where you will understand that transmission of great arteries is indeed the more common out of these two. Okay, first parameter affected by IUGR is abdominal circumference and last parameter is those of fetal head and GDM is high sugar down 24 weeks. Gestational hypertension, no anomalies. So that's what I'm trying to tell you again. Gestation hypertension, preeclampsia, high blood pressure after 20 weeks, and GDM has no anomalies. It's a revision. Now, how do you diagnose GDM? GDM is diagnosed by one step test now. The glucose challenge test and the glucose tolerance test with 100 grams, all of that is outdated stuff. So we do one step test, that is GTD with 75 grams. This is recommended by the American Diabetic Association and accepted by most of our hospitals. That's why it's been coming in the AMC exam for the last six to seven years. So please remember, you give uh, fasting levels and then uh, 75 grams of glucose and then you do one hour after this load and then you do two hours after this load so fasting should be less than 92 one hour should be less than 180 and two hours it should be less than 153 and any one abnormal value any one abnormal value is known as gdm okay uh different values in GTT I, I don't know see Dipsy test and all I'm not even bothered to teach you I mean it is never coming exams Dipsy is used it's just a single step test it is done in most of the hospitals and just one step I mean whatever is the fasting status of this mother whether she's eaten or not eaten we give her uh, the load of glucose and after one hour after uh, one hour if it is more than 140 then we say it is a diabetic so that is not used okay that is not used most of the places in your exams it is not used okay it's a good thing but we are not talking about that Chale, aage hai. occipital posterior what is the most common mal presentation i told you it is breach what is the most common presenting part vertex what is the most common position of vertex so most common position of vertex is left occipital transverse left occipital anterior what is the most common mal position most common mal position mal position guys I'm not saying mal presentation. Most common mal position is occipital posterior, and that is right occipital posterior. All right, right occipital posterior is the most common. Now, LOT is more common than LOA. LOT is 40 percent. LOA is around 30 percent. So please remember, most common is LOT. Now, weight and watch is the best management in occipital posterior this has come in aims exam when it was only aims then it has come in ini ct exams occipital posterior comes in your mci exams occipital posterior they're very fond of asking please remember if you see occipital posterior then the back of the baby occipital posterior obviously the back of the baby is towards the maternal spine so under the umbilicus there is sudden flattening of the mother's abdomen and very obviously heard heart of the baby because moment you put the chest of the baby is towards the anterior abdominal wall of the mother you'll hear a very prominent heart and there'll be sub umbilical flattening of the abdomen and in occipital posterior if you diagnose weight and what in labor why because in 80 percent cases it rotates to occipital anterior it delivers then 15 to 16 percent stays occipital posterior it delivers by face to pubis this will also deliver and two to four percent rotates to occipital transverse you can do manual rotation forceps extraction manual rotation if it goes to occipital transfer you can complete the rotation manually with your hands and do a forceps extraction but if it is neglected if neglected occipital transverse neglected then it becomes deep transverse arrest and for that you do a cesarean section all right so Occipital posterior, 
most of it you see 80 percent and then 60 96 97 percent are going to deliver so wait and watch is the best policy in occipital posterior sometimes if it becomes occipital transfer still you can make it deliver but if it is neglected occipital transfers and it becomes deep transfers arrest then go ahead and do a cesarean section all right most common complication of iucd is bleeding three times more common than pain IUCD, no contraindication in nulliparity. Please don't say this, okay? Lot of you have an idea that in a nulliparison, how will you put an IUCD? That means the whole of West. West people are not interested in having children very early. You know, by 35, 40, they start planning their children. And their sexual activity starts much earlier than the Indian sexual activity. 16, 17, Western girls are active most of the times. So, if they are active even at 18, you think they are not going to use IUCD as a contraception because they are going to have children only at 40 years? So for this 22 years of sexual life, you think they are not going to use IUCDs? I mean, they are the ones who actually designed the IUCDs. They are the ones who started making IUCDs and the best IUCDs, the most sophisticated IUCDs are made in the West and they make IUCDs so that they don't use them. I mean, nulli because they are nulli paras, they not, can't use it, is it? Is there a law like that? I don't know how you got that idea. I mean, they are making an IUCD device so that it can be sent to India and Bangladesh, right? Because they have a lot of children. So second uh, pregnancy onwards, I mean, I mean, first delivery and uh, after that, multi-parasols, you can put an IUCD. I mean, let's send, make IUCDs, but send it to India and Bangladesh because they have a lot of uh, children. And after first child, we can put an IUCD. I, what kind of logic is that? IUCD can be put in a, if a uterus, if a uterus can push blood out through the cervix, that uterus can easily receive an IUCD. There's no contraindication to IUCD in a nulliparous woman. Wherever you heard of it, please remember. All right, it's wrong. Nowadays in India also new common trend. Oh yeah, Satyam Prashad, yeah, that is society will change. And this is uh, fine. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about subject for the time being. Most common complication of IUCD is bleeding and no contraindication of IUCD in a nulliparous woman. Cardiac output increases maximum in 30, 32 weeks, and that is because the increase is 50%. Post-nidal period, it is even more increased, that is 70% increase of cardiac output. So when does failure happen in antenatal period? Around 30, 32 weeks. When does failure happen throughout pregnancy and post-nidal time? More likely in the post-nidal time, it is almost uh, the most common time because the cardiac output increases 70% at that moment. All right. Greenish yellow frothy discharge, strawberry vagina, colpitis macularis is seen in trachomonas vaginalis. And clue cells, fishy odor, whiff test, creamy discharge seen in bacterial vaginosis. This is known as the AMSELS criteria. AMSELS criteria also includes alkaline pH. Of course, treatment of both of these, treatment of both of these is metronidazole. Okay. Please read about this. These are very easy questions easy grabbing uh, marks because they will ask you about two cells they will ask you about strawberry vagina which is known as colpitis macros they will ask you about this treat both partners in trachomoniasis but bacteria vaginosis has no sexual transformation now metronidazole is the drug of choice like i mentioned in the previous slide and it is even the drug of choice when a woman is having pregnancy and bacterial vaginosis so i've touched 100 uh, lines already so what the hell we'll give you some more lines Drug of choice for gonorrhea in pregnancy is ceftriaxone and azithromycin. See, when I say um, uh, treatment of gonorrhea, we know the drug of choice are third generation or even injectable, um, any one shot of injectable cephalosporins. Any injectable cephalosporin, even second generation can be given. But in pregnancy, we say that when there is chlamydia, they, uh, when there is gonorrhea, there could be chlamydia lurking. So in pregnancy, when we give treatment of gonorrhea, also treat the chlamydia. So in pregnancy, if they ask you, this was Jipma entrance question around three years back, and when it was only Jipma entrance. So please remember, when there is question asked about just gonorrhea, you say injectable cephalosporins, but they say gonorrhea in pregnancy, then you add to this ceftriaxone the azithromycin because that will take care of the chlamydia also. Now, this is what we discussed recently, and you must have a quick revision on this. The Y chromosome has a short arm, which is having the SRY, and the long arm has the azoospermia factors. And the proximal factor is uh, the azoospermia factor A, and it causes definite azoospermia. And azoospermia factor B is the most severe, and azoospermia factor C is the mildest condition and the most common azoospermia factor which is seen. So azoospermia factor 
is some micro deletions which can happen in the Y chromosome. You see the Y chromosome is seen but there are some microscopic deletions in this and these micro deletions are azospermia A, B and C factors and a azospermia C factor is the most common and it is the mildest. All right, You will get sperms in this. You can use the sperms all the very less. So you can use the sperms for only for ICSI. You can give this uh, father his own bio biological child. All right. So how do it detects this micro deletion? They are detected by the multiplex PCR. Okay, most common cause of histidism is not idiopathic. It is PCOS and also other causes are like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome, ovarian adrenal tumors. And idiopathic is not the commonest. Once again, it is 25% causes of histidism is idiopathic. No cause is seen. Androgens levels are normal and um, there are no tumors so we say everything is fine but the girl is hairy that is what is idiopathic which is only 25 percent but the most common cause of histidism straight away given as the opening line in the chapter of pcos and of histidism most common cause of histidism is indeed pcos no change in that okay and if a girl is hairy think of pcos first of course i've given you other choices also classification of uh, the uh, hirsutism is by the ferryman galloway uh, method and it has got nine areas and nine areas are like the upper lip chin chest upper back lower back upper abdomen lower abdomen upper arms and thighs but not included very importantly the arms forearms forearms and legs and also not included are the eyebrows eyebrows and the side locks these side locks. So these locks being prominent and the eyebrows being a little thick doesn't mean hirsutism. But the other areas which I mentioned that means hirsutism. So each area is given you know slight excess hair or very excess hair a score from 1 to 4 and then all these nine areas are scored 1 to 4 and if a total score is more than 8, 8 or more then we say it is hirsutism by the ferryman galloway classification. Now first sign of puberty because puberty does not happen only in girls. Let's not get confused any more about this MCQ. Puberty happens both in boys. Please don't forget that boys also have puberty. Girls' puberty is much more obvious changes. Boys also have puberty happening, okay? So boys and girls, the first sign of puberty is physical growth. Now when I talk about specific signs for girls, then first sign of puberty is specifically in girls. If they ask you first sign of puberty in girls like that, they ask you, please write breast. If they ask you first sign of puberty overall, then obviously, please read the question properly. See what happens, the question comes properly, you guys tend to recall it uh, poorly when you tell us the choices. So that's why this confusion goes on happening. So please read the theory properly. Puberty happens to both boys and girls. And both boys and girls, they start growing physically when they get into puberty. Specific changes in boys, you know, testicular enlargement, pili enlargement, hair being, being uh, you know, only around the scrotum, then coming all around the scrotum and into the uh, middle part of the thighs and going to the upper abdomen and lower abdomen. All those changes are there in boys also. But there are no drastic events like breast growth or, you know, periods happening. So these are, you know, very visual kind of, you know, obvious kind of changes in a young girl happening. So that's why specific events in girls are more defined and that's why that's why it comes in your mcqs more commonly so specific signs in puberty in a girl first is breast all right so remember thelak pubark peak growth velocity which is height and then once she has periods then height grows height does not grow any further all right so uh questions on this i don't think you're asking me okay then testicular feminization syndrome, very common MCQ, it is a high androgens which are not working. So the androgens get converted in the periphery into estrogens. So this gentleman, this boy who is born has got no working androgens. So male organs don't form by default, female organs form. And when this boy grows, more and more androgens are formed when the testes make androgens and the adrenal make androgens, these androgens are not utilized. So these androgens are converted in the periphery to estrogens. So at puberty, this boy starts growing breast also. And the genitalia, action genitalia is a vulva. So this boy does not know he's a boy. He thinks he's a girl, parents think he's a girl. And at 14, 15, they'll come to you with primary amenorrhea. And the parents will say that this girl is not getting periods. But you will find out that this is actually a very pretty boy, in fact. So this boy is looking like a girl in testicular feminization syndrome. All right. So you have to raise these people only as girls. You cannot make them boys. And these girls will, these so-called girls will get very feminine at puberty. So after pubertal spurt, 
of these estrogens, these androgens will convert into estrogens when she gets the feminine habitus, breast and the body habitus. After that, you should take out these testes because these testes are mostly undescended. So undescended testes, you know, will cause cancers. Right. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a girl who is born like a boy if it is early onset. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, if it is happening in a girl, there will be a lot of androgens in the intrauterine life of a girl. So intrauterine life, there should not be androgens. Androgens make a boy absence of androgen makes a girl okay please read the chapter of uh, uh, sexual development disorders of sexual development uh, on the prep ladder forum whenever you have time and it's a very interesting chapter but slightly longish around two two and a half hours if you've not done so far maybe some other time but it's an interesting chapter where i've taught you that androgens make a boy and absence of androgen makes a girl so if a girl in her intrauterine life gets congenital adrenal hyperplasia androgens will come and this girl will be born with a scrotum and a penis so looks like a boy so most common cause is 21 hydroxylase deficiency second most common cause is a 11 hydroxylase deficiency and not 17 second most common is 11 hydroxylase deficiency and the treatment is long-term steroids all right so most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding is CS cervix in our country. C endometrium is diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and obesity with irregular acyclical bleeding. Also may have also may have postmenopausal bleeding, but irregular acyclic bleeding which is technically called menometorrhagia all right post menopause bleeding most common cause is cs cervix for you guys please don't think in terms of uh, western causes i'm coming to those also india think of cs cervix all your mcqs but yes um where's that mcq oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay okay i'll just tell you this because I think I've, that MCQ is slightly moved somewhere else. So in the Western Hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere, CS cervix is mostly you know, diagnosed uh, much earlier and patient does not have post-menopausal bleeding or post coital bleeding presentation. So Western Hemisphere, C endometrium is more likely a problem, but that is only 10%. Hyperplasia is another 10%. But the most common cause of post-menopausal bleeding in the Western Hemisphere is endometrial atrophy and atrophic endometrium gets infected and becomes endometrial atrophy atrophic endometrium tends to get infected easily and that endometrium is now called endometritis so senile endometritis senile endometritis which often is given as the answer in many of your books is a more common cause in the West. Post menopause bleeding in India, there will be a rampant, rampant number of CS cervix. All your interns, I mean, those who are sitting wherever in this country, and wherever you're sitting, those who have done internship in India, or in, let's say, Nepal and in China, tell me how many of you have seen CS endometrium? And then now, how many of you have seen CS cervix? I'm sure quite a few of you are raising your hands because you've seen CS cervix. But mostly you've not seen CS endometrium because CS cervix is so rampant in a country. All right? It is the most common cause of post menopause bleeding. And any one of you, please raise your hands if you've seen senile endometritis. Seriously, raise your hands. Send me a message if you've seen senile endometritis. It does happen. I have seen senile endometritis because I'm a gynecologist. It's 1996 onwards, I'm a gynecologist. It's a lot of years, 27 years of being a gynecologist. I've seen senile endometritis. Happens to the Western like women in our country, you know, the well to do women. Yes, they have a trophic endometrium around 50 55 years. It gets endometritic and it starts having some amount of bleeding. It has happened to so many of my relatives, senile endometritis. But the number of CA service, the amount of CA service I've seen in my life, there's no comparison. All right, so please remember these data. You will be asked only Indian data. All right, anyway, uh, right. AK-47, no one knows. No, no, we know it. <laughs> Definitely we know it. You guys are in a confusion because you have 19 subjects to read and I'm just one peripheral part of your reading and CA service is just one part of a chapter in Gaini. So yes, we know the answers. It's for you to get convinced. 
चलो बेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ ऑस्टोपोरस इज मोर कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीज बेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ ऑस्टोपोरस इज इन डीड ईस्ट रिजन आफ्टर सिक्सटी ईयर्स इट इज बेस्ट फॉस्टोनेट्स वी हैड दिस डिस्कशन इवन लास्ट वीक एंड आई एम टेलिंग यू दैट एम सी क्यू वंस मोर बिकॉज इट केम इन आई एन आई सी टी आई एम कीपिंग इट हेयर एज अ प्रूफ फॉर यू गाइज दे आस्ट यू क्वेश्चन वॉट इज द बेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ ऑस्टोपोरस आफ्टर सिक्सटी ईयर्स ऑफ एज आई एग्री आफ्टर सिक्सटी ईयर्स ऑफ एज इट इज इन डीड बेस्ट फॉस्टोनेट्स बिकॉज आफ्टर सिक्सटी इट इज बेस्ट फॉस्टोनेट्स सो बिफोर सिक्सटी दैट इज फिफ्टी टू सिक्सटी ईयर्स ऑफ that time of menopause it is something else after 60 they asking you and you know the answer is bisphosphonates that means before 60 it is something else let's just stop here today let's not tell all the proof which i have shown you earlier in our discussions so after 60 it is bisphosphonate so it means before 60 it is something else and that is estrogens so yes i know the controversy exists again and gynae is full of contra- contradictions between lot of teachers can't help it go to the books and Shaw's is writing it clearly. Novak is writing it clearly. I know the controversy exists. Royal College says give bisphosphonates. American says give estrogens. So which is which is the book you want to follow? The book which is Indian, the Indian edition of Shaw, the information which is given in your day to day life from your gynecologist, and we give estrogens as the first drug, fifty to sixty years. After sixty, if she has. Uh, Uh, osteoporosis giving issues can cause more post i mean uh, more problems of uh, uh, coronary artery diseases so after 6 years we give this phosphonate chalo enough of that uh, this time best assessment of pelvic anatomy in infertility is by a laparoscopy laparoscopy plus hysteroscopy laparoscopy hysteroscopy plus ct chromotivation or the dye test you can say chromotivation or you can say the dye test diagnosis of endometriosis laparoscopy and hysteroscopy diagnosis of pid laparoscopy and hysteroscopy diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy best laparoscopy and hysteroscopy so in ectopic i will take out the hysteroscopy part and in pid i'll take out the hysteroscopy part i wanted you to just concentrate on laparoscopy so laparoscopy is the diagnosis for all of these four of course in pid and in a case of ectopy you don't have to do the hysteroscopy so laparoscopy as the method of choice in four five places and even in gynae so what i'm trying to tell you here in any of your specialties any surgical specialties any medical specialty in any organ disease if that organ can be accessed by a scope then that scope becomes the best method of diagnosis like ent everything is, all the uh, uh, ent areas are accessible by scopes so all of these are the best methods of diagnosis i'm sure ent guys must be teaching you that and even um, upper gi lower gi scope is the best answer so that is what is in general i'm sure you have much more uh, refined information i'm telling you if you can reach an area with a scope that is the best way of diagnosing a disease of that area chali aage badhte hain Ops and gynae is all about controversy. Yes, uh, G to Mina, you have uh, heard about it from me. That it is full of controversies because you're reading wrong sources. That's the problem. Go ahead and follow what is happening in the clinics, and there will be no controversies. As simple as that. The problem is we are not following the clinics. We are following a lot of literature which is from the internet. So that's where the controversies. Yes, I agree. My subject has the maximum controversies because it is following a lot of internet-related information. If you just follow the clinics and what is happening in the hospitals, this controversy will not be there. Take it from me. Anyway, let's move on. Those who are interns will, uh, I'm sure, most of it. What I've said today, you will concur with that. You'll agree with that. Endometrium of concern in menopausal age. Thickness of endometrium in concern. Okay, I forgot to write this part. Thickness of endometrium of concern in menopausal age. so it is generally 3 mm and lesser in menopause so more than equal to 4 mm is bad news endometrium should be less than 4 so 3 and less is good anything more than 4 mm is bad news so more than 4 or 5 sometimes they'll give you so 4 is that cut off you know 5 and more they say i'm writing 4 and more here doesn't matter they'll ask you only 4 or 5 they'll not ask you much uh, other choices so If you say four and less is fine, five and more is bad. Let me just refine this information a little bit more. So uh, less than four, okay. Maybe I'll just write it even better. I'll just strike off this and say less than equal to four and more than equal to five, so that there's no confusion. 
just now uh, Jiten was saying that there are so many controversies. So let's make it clear for you. Less than or equal to four is fine. Just take out the three out of your, because a lot of us have their own practical methods of working. So less than or equal to four is fine and more than or equal to five is bad. Chalo. Diagnosis of menopause is FSH more than 40 international units. HRT indications mainly hot flushes and osteoporosis. These are the main indications of hormone replacement therapy. But mind you, hormone replacement therapy, especially by estrogens, is not given, is not given before one year of menopause has stopped. One year of menopause, then only you should give. All right? Primary amenorrhea, another controversy. <laughs> so primary amenorrhea is 13 years. If a girl doesn't have periods till 13 years, primary amenorrhea. And with secondary sexual characters, it is 15 years. Some of you will ask me 14 and 16, which is very, very outdated. Last three editions of NOACs have been mentioning 13 and 15. So don't even think about saying 14 and 16. Okay, so if a girl does not get periods by 13, it is primary menorrhea or delayed periods. If she has pubic hair, then we can wait till 15. So pubic hair and 15 also she does not have, I mean, does not have periods, then we say at 15 it is delayed periods of primary amenorrhea. All right, 13 and 15. And uh, I'm just giving you a statement from Novak so that you don't get uh, nervous anymore about the information. See, giving a proof every time I feel that uh, since I'm giving you the answers which are slightly different from what you've been hearing. So that's why I'm saying delayed or interrupted puberty exists in girls who fail to develop any secondary sexual characters by age 13, have not had menarche by age 15, or have not attained menarche five years or more since the onset of pubertal development. So this is the gist of what uh, I've split and given in the previous slide. Right. So about semen parameters, they have changed recently in 2021 and 2022, we introduced the recent WHO manual and that WHO manual has given you fifth to 95th percentile values. So less than fifth percentile values, fifth and below is what are lesser values. So fifth centile values are what are discussed with you. So what has changed, I'm giving you here first, what has changed? these four have changed the major parameters out of them these four have changed semen volume which was 1.5 is now 1.4 and the total motility which was 40 is now 42 percent and active motility which was 32 percent is now 30 percent and the vitality which was 58 percent that means even if 54 percent sperms are uh, live it is good enough so just a minute change but a whole i mean if you see the who manual it's a huge new book it is free of cost on the internet i mean you can download it and take a printout pdf on the who website you can see and uh, so much of research has gone to reduce these values a little bit i mean alter these values a little bit so the complete uh, semen parameter i mean if you want to see this i've given you the whole of it and the ones in yellow the ones in yellow are the ones which are constant from the previous one so that's why i feel they're going to ask you the ones which are constant the total volume the morphology and the pus cells. These are still constant from the, the 2010 WHO values to 2021 values. These are not changed. So that's why they may still ask you what is the morphology, which is still 4%. By the way, which is, by the, way, which is the single best parameter which is uh, used for semen parameters. Single best parameter is indeed the morphology because even if one normal morphological sperm is there, we can use it for putting it directly into the egg of the lady and give her a, her the own biological child of this couple, all right? So those who are interested and have some time, you can read about one uh, lecture which I've made on YouTube, which is uh, free of charge, obviously. You can see, uh, azospermic man gets his own biological child. Of course, you must put my name, then you'll get that azospermia. A lot of very good teachers have been teaching you on the internet. But if you put my name and uh, you put uh, azospermic man gets his own biological child, and with me, I mean, there's one very interesting lecture with some procedures which come in exams. Uh, testicular aspiration procedures I've shown you there. Okay, best investigation to assess pelvic anatomy, slide repeat, laparoscopic, hysteroscopy and chromotivation. Aspiration of sperms in uh, azospermia. You can do microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration, MISA. Microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration. You can also do testicular sperm aspiration. You can do percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration or you can do testicular sperm extraction. These are the four techniques which are asked in your exams and the single best technique is the microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration. That is the MCQ which you have to answer. My favorite technique is PISA. 
most of my patients that I'm able to get sperms in that. If I don't get sperms in that in the patients, then I go ahead and do the testicular sperm aspiration. My personal favorites are these two, but my favorites are not the MCQ answers. The MCQ answers are the microsurgical epidermal sperm aspirations, and microscopes are expensive to come by, and most of the times we are able to get sperms by these simpler techniques. That's why my favorites and the method of choice is different. Your answer is MISA. Single most important parameter of this semen parameters is the morphology. Most common cause of vesicovaginal fistula is obstructed labor. Most common site of vesicular fistula is the vesicovaginal fistula is the mid vaginal fistula. Best investigation for vesicovaginal fistula, I'll wait for this one. Yes, uh, I know I'm giving you more than the hundred lines which we promised, but yes, uh, best investigation for VVF. How about this answer, guys? Let's see. What are you going to tell me? Okay. All right, I'm waiting for your answers, guys. Three swab tests, dancing doctor. So, <laughs> three swab tests is the only test which you understand easily in gynae, I think. That's the only test which makes sense. You know, you put uh, three cotton balls in the vagina, and uh, these three cotton balls, and uh, the uterus is uh, now, uh, I mean, the bladder is now filled up with methylene blue, and depending on the site of the fistula, you know, uh, whether it's high, mid, or low, that cotton ball will get blue in color. So it's the easiest test to understand in gynae, I think. That's why all of us keep writing three swap tests. That's not the right answer, please. Uh, who is writing the right answer? Oh, a lot of you are writing the three, uh, right answer. Yes, MRI is not the best, please. So best investigation of VVF is indeed the cystoscopy, okay? You can get into the uterus. Get into the uterus and you can localize this, this, or this. You can localize what is the site of the fistula. So easy, isn't it? So best is cystoscopy. Three swab test is a good OPD test you can do for the assessment of the site. I'm not saying it's a bad test. You understand it well, I know. But yes, if they ask you all fistulas, all genitourinary fistulas, that kind of broad, not just from the bladder to the vagina, vesico vagina, no, no. From the bladder, they can be fistula into the uterus. They can be a fistula from the ureter to the vagina. So all genitourinary fistulas, if you want to know, then intravenous urography. IVU is the best method, or IVP like we used to call it earlier, intravenous pilography, or we call it intravenous urography. That is the single best test. If they ask you all genitourinary fistulas, for just for vesicovaginal fistula, go ahead and mark cystoscopy. Repair of vesicovaginal fistula is best done in three months, okay? We want these cuttings to heal. We want these cuttings to heal then only you can place a suture which will hold. So three months, whatever scar tissue has sloughed off, whatever tissue has sloughed off, the cut end should get, uh, cut end should get um, epithelized. Wait, I'll show that to you, those who are hearing it for the first time. See, this is the uterus and this is the vagina and this is the bladder and there is a vesicovaginal fistula here. See, there's a fistula here. So this, you will not suture immediately. They'll present to you at five to seven days after the obstructed labor. Now, if you suture them immediately, then these cut ends, see these cut ends are ischemic. So if you put a suture now, they will slough off. And that's why you will wait for three months. You wait, see secondary intention. This is principle of pathology. I mean, it's principle of healing in your path book, I meant to say. In your path book, they teach you, they takes, you know, secondary intention takes long, so let at least three months form, let three months pass so that there's a good scar tissue form. So yes, you wait for three months for these cut ends to become nice and scarred. And then when you place your sutures, they will stay there and they will not break away. So yes, if there's a vesicovaginal fistula, three months. If there's a complete peneal tear which is neglected beyond 24 hours, again three months, no six weeks business. It's there in most of the books you will have to look at them. I know, again, I'm telling you some controversial answers. I kind of like them now. Now, best support of uterus is the levator and eye muscle. Okay, don't say the McEnrod. Best ligament support is the cardinal, which is also known as the McEnrod's ligament and also called the cardinal ligament, all right? Most common cause of prolapse is abnormal conduct of labor all right most common cause of prolapse is abnormal conduct of labor best classification of prolapse is by the 
pelvic organ prolapse quantification all right did i miss some question three months all right yes most of you got it correct did i miss some question maybe we have done this best investigation yeah i think i answered that one so best classification prolapse is the pop q classification we uh, have uh, marks we have points in the anterior vagina and the posterior vagina and at the vault and at the cervix so we see how much these points are coming down out of the uh, vagina into the external part of the woman's body so we measure them how much they're coming down and we make a grid of nine boxes and based on that we make a grading of this prolapse so pelvic organ quantification system is given on a lot of your channels on youtube and uh, it will take around two to three hours for me to make you understand so some other forum some other place i think i'm going to make a video on that because it's a uh, it's an interesting thing to teach and those who are interested in uh, obs and gynae are the ones who should learn it of course maybe when i make an app for just for the postgraduates it's going to be part of it but yes, uh, my undergraduate friends, if you know that POPQ is the best method of uh, grading the prolapse because it can be uh, used internationally. You know, if I send a, you know, a grid of what prolapse I see and then I send it to somebody, let's say the doctor is in Africa, in Ghana, and he's doing a study of women who have prolapse. So the incidence of prolapse in my country with this stage, in his country with this stage, he can compare it exactly because my staging and his staging of the POPQ method will be the same. That's why it is the best method of staging prolapse, uh, pelvic organ prolapse quantification or the POPQ. It's called the POPQ classification. Decubitus ulcer on the prolapse is due to venous congestion because the uterus, if you imagine, the uterus is hanging out of the vagina like this. So when the uterus hanging out of the vagina, this vagina is holding the uterus and the blood supply. See this uterus, the blood supply, the arterial flow will go, but the venous return will stop by this uh, you know vaginal band on top of the uterus so this uterus will be having a venous congestion so venous congestion is deoxygenated blood so small ulcers you know when the uterus rubs on the undergarment also of this woman or on the chair which she's sitting she may have some small erosions and they will not heal because the blood is deoxygenated or venous blood so venous blood will not support healing so the treatment of this decubitus ulcer is repose it this uterus back inside and hold it with the pessary or with the packing and then the venous return happens and the fresh blood comes in and healing happens. The best treatment of a decubitus ulcer is to reposit the uterus. We add some acriflavin and glycerine. We add some glycerine and acriflavin packs. We call them glycerine acriflavin packs. So either you can put a pessary and that will cause the healing and you can push the uterus back inside with the pack of glycerine and acriflavin soap. So that glycerin is a hygroscopic agent which will take out the edema of this area and acriflavin is a antiseptic, local antiseptic that will help in controlling the infection. So best treatment is to do a reposition. Please don't say when there's a decubitus ulcer, you'll do a hysterectomy. Please, you have to heal the decubitus ulcer and then do the hysterectomy. Why? Because this whole uterus is ischemic and if you do a surgery on an ischemic uterus, all of the repair which you do will break through and the bubble will hang out. So please don't say, decubitus also go ahead and do a hysterectomy. Please wait for these tissues to get oxygenated. It takes around a month for this to perfectly heal or even more sometimes and then only do a hysterectomy, okay? Most common type of endometrial cancer is the endometroid adenocarcinoma. Worst prognosis of clear cell adenocarcinoma and serous variety in endometrial cancer. Staging is the single most prognostic factor for CA endometrial heart facts. All right. CA cervix specific and most common symptom. Specific symptom is post coital bleeding. Okay, and um, that is what is the most common symptom also. So specific and most common symptom is post coital bleeding. Now CA endometrium specific and most common symptom is the menometorrhagia, which I told you is irregular acyclical bleeding. So CA cervix it is post coital bleeding and CA endometrium it is menometorrhagia which is also known as irregular cycle bleeding. However both of these can have post menopausal bleeding and this can also have post menopausal bleeding. 
so also postmenopause bleeding and also postmenopause bleeding so postmenopause bleeding can be seen in both CA cervix and CA endometrium specific for CA endometrium is irregular acyclic bleeding in a diabetes mellitus hypertension obese woman specific for CA cervix is postcardial bleeding so most common and specific for CA cervix is postcardial bleeding all right however postmenopause bleeding can be seen in both so if i ask you the other way what is the most common cause of postmenopause bleeding say CA cervix which we already discussed uh, some slides before most common ovarian tumor is the surface epithelial tumor all right most common epithelial tumor is the serous cyst adenoma most is the serous cyst adenoma most common germ cell tumor is the teratoma and teratoma is 10 percent benign and nine i'm so sorry 10 percent malignant and 90 percent it is benign so the benign teratoma that is what is known as the dermoid all right so most common germ cell tumor is not this germinoma please don't get confused most common ovarian tumor is surface epithelial most common surface epithelial is serous cyst adenoma so what is the question what is the most common ovarian tumor serous cyst adenoma now what is the most common germ cell tumor teratoma teratomas are mostly benign 90 percent so what is the most common type of teratoma the benign one which is 90 percent what is that dermoid dermoid is the most common germ cell tumor not the malignant variety the benign variety is most common so most common teratoma is the benign teratoma which is the well differentiated teratoma like that also they say and that is dermoid all right and dermoid is also the most common tumor of pregnancy and it's also the most common tumor of torsion now most common germ cell malignancy wait a minute most common ovarian tumor epithelial most common ovarian tumor in the epithelial type serous most common ovarian tumor is the serous cyst adenoma most common germ cell tumor teratoma which is the most common teratoma benign teratoma known as the dermoid now which is the most common germ cell malignancy different question now out of germ cell tumors the most common germ cell malignancy is the dysgerminoma it is 40 to 45 percent it is 40 to 45 percent of all germ cell malignancies all right so it's a very common mcq and uh, i think somehow you get this answer wrong okay no not granulosa granulosa is not a germ cell tumor granulosa tumor is a sex cord tumor guys so most of you got a dysgerminoma correct me syndrome is of course uh, fibroma of the ovary fibroma plus ascites and plus pleural effusion mci students favorite mcq for you guys of course pg entrance also it came very recently in the inict exam now pseudo mix syndrome is more neat exam kind of mcq any other ovarian tumor any other ovarian tumor plus ascites and pleural effusion so any other ovarian tumor with the status in pleural effusion is known as the pseudo mix syndrome and most common cause of pseudo mix syndrome most commonly it is the brenner tumor please take this slide down because it's important meek syndrome is fibroma ascites pleural effusion now any other ovarian tumor can cause uh, ascites and pleural effusion but that is now called the pseudo mix syndrome and which is the more common of these pseudo mix syndrome causes it is a brenner tumor all right uh, yeah i think you got it right Dysgerminoma increases the LDH, plasma, alkaline phosphate is an ENHCG, but not alpha fetoprotein. So that is the MCQ. Dysgerminoma does not increase the alpha fetoprotein. Alpha fetoprotein does increase in germ cell tumors, but not in dysgerminoma. Germ cell tumors like yolk sac tumor, endodermal sinus tumor, in this, the alpha fetoprotein will increase, but it does not increase in dysgerminoma. It uh, even HCG might be increased in dysgerminoma, but not alpha fetoprotein. This germinoma does not increase the alpha fetoprotein. That was the next statement. So Schiller dual bodies are seen in endodermal sinus tumor, which is also known as the yolk sac tumor. Okay, and this also there's a specific marker specific for this yolk sac tumor is alpha one antitrypsin. Alpha one antitrypsin is the specific for the yolk sac tumor. Carl Exner bodies. Now, this is the one which you should be giving me answer. 
Carl is nobody. Yes. Uh, mm, okay, that is correct. Granulosa cell tumor. Granulosa cell tumor. Carl legs no. Not disjunctive, my friend. Carl legs nobody is seen in. Granulosa cell tumor. What is the marker of granulosa cell tumor? Granulosa cells make estrogen. So granulosa cell tumor will make high estrogens. But that's not the marker. The marker of granulosa cell tumor is inhibin. All right. Best indicator of ovarian reserve is the antimolarin hormone. FSH and AFC antral follicular count is also a good indicator. But antral follicular count should be around 6 to 7 per ovary and less than equal to 3 per ovary is poor reserve of a woman's chances of getting pregnant. Menopausal age, FSH is more than 40. I think this came even earlier in the discussions. So I'm not necessarily looking at 100. I'm looking way beyond. So if there are some repeats, I'm sure you'll uh, pardon me on that. So FSH is more than 40 before 40 years what is that called fsh more than 40 is menopause but if this fsh is more than 40 before 40 years what is that called yes uh, shall i wait for before you give me the answer fsh more than yeah, yeah in even a that is correct fsh more than 40 before 40 years is not premature yeah it's premature menopause is actually you're trying to say early menopause so menopause age is 48 to 47 to 48 in india 51 to 52 in the world world average is 51 to 52. woman gets menopause at 45 44 43 early menopause but if it is before 40 then it is not called early menopause it is called premature ovarian failure yes quite a lot of you got it correct premature ovarian failure okay pyramidal follicles are maximum at 20 weeks of intrauterine life. At 20 weeks, it is maximum. It is 6 to 7 million at that time. Primary follicles at puberty are only 3 to 4 lakhs at puberty. So, it is 6 to 7 million at 20 weeks of intrauterine life. And after birth, it is only 1 to 2 million. And then at puberty, they are not in millions, they are only in lakhs, three to four lakhs. And that's why they keep reducing every month. That's why women will finally finish the follicles around 45 to 50. And when the follicles finish, estrogen doesn't form. Estrogen doesn't form, the woman doesn't have endometrium growing and they stop having periods. The follicles finish and that's the reason of menopause. All right. Snowstorm appearance. Why did I ask you this question? Very simple. It's come in at least four exams out of the last six. In the last three years, out of six exam, four exams, this question was asked. And that is in molar pregnancy. Partial mole presence as missed abortion. The symptoms are like missed abortion. Like missed abortion. The woman is pregnant. You'll see a fetus in the ultrasound. Placenta looks on the ultrasound mostly normal. Partial mole and the placenta, you will not be able to see vesicles so easily on the ultrasound. So it looks like a normal pregnancy which is continuing and there's a fetus also which is there. Heartbeat is there. By around 12 to, 12 to 16 weeks, the baby just dies. So that is what is a partial mole. Partial mole, the baby is alive and next ultrasound you see the baby is dead. That is what is known as a missed abortion. So it presents as a missed abortion. Only when you send the uh, fetus to the path lab, then they will tell you that it was a partial mole. Complete mole, most common presentation is bleeding, PV caffeine is correct. Bleeding, pervaginum is the most common presentation of complete mole. Passage of grape like vesicles is not. Treatment of molar pregnancy, suction evacuation, any size, please remember any size of uterus, please do suction evacuation. All right. Do not say DNC. Okay, they might ask you, uh, AIMS people are very happy asking this MCQ. Do not say uh, hysterectomy because a woman is 40 years and there's a large uterus. Please always say D N E, dilat I mean, I'm so sorry. <laughs> always say suction and evacuation. Don't say dilatation and curatage, I meant to say. Always say suction evacuation. All right, that is any size of uterus with molar pregnancy. Please remember, in molar pregnancy, the size of the uterus is much more than the uh, pregnancy duration. Suppose the pregnancy is only 8 weeks, but you may see a uterus of 20 weeks. Like that, you may see a big uterus, you may see. Alright? 
HCG normal value at you know we're talking molar pregnancy so it's in relation to that so in complete mole it takes around nine weeks in partial mole it takes seven weeks and those who are answering eight weeks and six weeks are answering wrong so nine weeks in a complete mole and partial mole it is seven weeks when the values come back to normal all right so high risk gestation troplastic disease means high risk staging wise staging wise stage one stage one is when there is limited to uterus stage two when it's in the pelvis stage three is in the lung and stage four is distant metastasis so when i say this staging distant is always high risk and limited to the uterus is low risk so this is very clear one method now who prognosing factors there are nine parameters and each parameters are giving a given a score so a total score less than seven less than equal to six and more than equal to seven this will be easier for you to remember so less than equal to six is a low risk and more than equal to seven is a higher risk so what are these nine parameters like uh, what is the blood group b blood group is worse prognosis what is the type of pregnancy a molar pregnancy causing choreic carcinoma a normal pregnancy causing choreic carcinoma or a abortion causing a choreic carcinoma so normal pregnancy causing choreic carcinoma worse prognosis and uh, if a person has high metastasis more than eight less than four four to eight more than eight metastatic sites metastasis to lung it's not even mentioned in the score that's why somewhere this question had come and people said metastasis to lung it's a high risk no guys please go and see the who prognostic scoring system it's not even mentioned in the scoring the lung is not even mentioned because it's the most common metastatic site so it does not change my scoring so lung is not even mentioned in the scoring what is mentioned liver and brain if it is liver and brain it is bad prognosis so based on all these nine parameters i give a score if the score is less than equal to six it is low risk more than equal to seven it is high risk so now two methods of scoring i told you one is stage one and stage four one is low risk four is high risk how do you say stage two and stage three are high risk or low risk stage two and stage three our term low risk and high risk based on this scoring yes so stage two core carcinoma limited to the pelvis and the nine factor score is less than equal to six it is a low score but if it is more than equal to seven then it is high risk so low risk and high risk this is the method of scoring so you have to know the who pronostic scoring system there are nine parameters how to do the scoring you should know the nine parameters the each uh, marks to each score that has never come in exam they'll give you that it is involving the liver and the brain it is high risk then more because more number of marks are given so they may help you with that information but how do you do the low risk and high risk stage one is low risk stage four is high risk end of discussion Stage three and stage four depends on the WHO prognostic scoring system. Less than equal to six is low risk, and more than equal to seven is high risk. Little difficult to uh, understand, and once you understand molar pregnancy, it becomes a very simple disorder. But there's so much to that that finally, what I've told you is the, you know, the final part of molar pregnancies and the trophoblastic diseases. So yes, uh, I hope you understood by this uh, quick discussion about high risk diseases. Right, guys. Uh, we had a lot of discussion, and please remember that some pictures I had given, they've uh, somehow not been included because uh, there were some problems regarding the uh, clarity of the pictures. I've just been given a message. So yes, there was one question which you asked me that uh, is um, previous ectopic a contraindication to IUCD? Absolutely not. Please, guys. I know you have given, you have been given this information that previous ectopic is an absolute contraindication of an IOCD. I'm so sorry it is wrong. I can show you, I can send you messages if you want. You can always get back to me at my email and that is uh, Dr. Prasan at yahoo.com. 
So when you uh, want to ask me about this, let me give you proof. And there is uh, the medical eligibility criteria. The medical eligibility criteria is one, two, three, and four. So medical eligibility criteria, if it is one and if it is four, that means one, you can use this contraceptive method and four is don't use this contraceptive method. At least this much you should know. So when I say that a woman had a previous ectopic and now she wants to use an IOCD, what is the medical eligibility criteria of this contraception in this condition? It is one. That means safe to use. It is given in most of your books, all right? Previous ectopic IOCD is safe to use. Previous PID and IOCD is safe to use. Current PID obviously you cannot put an IOCD, all right? So these are all very straightforward. And again, I already told you the nulliparity is not a contraindication for an IUCD. So yes, I know I have given you a lot of answers which may be a little difficult from what you read, but that's how it is. It is coming from a lot of experience of teaching and a lot of experience of working day in and day out in OBS and Gaini. You know how OBS and Gaini is. So I hope I've been able to tell you all of this with some conviction. And please remember these quick uh, discussion of uh, maybe how many hours we've been sitting here. It's almost two hours. So I hope you will uh, keep this in your mind, all these quick discussions, and you'll go back and replace, I mean, just, uh, you know, uh, revise all of this once more whenever you get the time and just go and put it into the exam books. I'm sure you'll get your desired in, uh, choice of post-graduation wherever you want it. Otherwise, uh, my parting advice is, if it is your first attempt, if it is your first attempt, read very hard. Get what you like. You know, if it's your first attempt, go ahead and give your best shot at it and go and get what you like. Achievement. But if it is your second attempt and third attempt, then like what you get. That is what is called happiness. I don't want you guys to be writing MC, MCQ exams all your life. If it is a third, fourth attempt, if you wanted medicine in only names, and if you're getting in a good state college, go ahead and take it. If you're getting in not in a good state college, go ahead and take a DNB in a good central city. If you're not getting even DNB in a good central city, take DNB wherever you're getting, take MD wherever you're getting. You're getting a degree. DNB and MD are both same now. They are giving you good career options and they are giving you government jobs. DNB is also giving you the same. So please don't go on writing. I mean, if you're not getting medicine, DNB or MD, and you're getting anesthesia, anesthesia, excellent branch. I mean, I can go on talking about anesthesia. And I can go on talking about uh, tuberculosis chest diseases. They are excellent MDs. So please widen your horizon. And like I said, first attempt, go and get what you want. You know, get what you like. That is what is achievement. Next attempt or third attempt or fourth attempt, like what you get, that is happiness. All right, guys, uh, thanks for staying back uh, for a longer class than what I had planned, but I'm sure most of you will gain when you revise this. Thank you so much and best wishes.